every single language is like holding a pair of keys to this Pandora's box of whichever culture it is. So learning in general is one of the most intimate and most personal experiences mm. that we can have in life. Welcome to the Rosetta Stone podcast brought to you by Rosetta Stone UK, preparing you for real world conversations in new languages. In our third episode, we're talking about dying languages and how important it is to protect them. And the perfect guests joining me to discuss this are Alex Rawlings and Susie Dent. Now, Alex is a linguist, a documentary filmmaker, and I believe he was crowned Britain's most multilingual student in 2012. And you, of course, all know the brilliant Susie Dent by now. Welcome to you both. Hello. Hello. So we heard a little bit, Susie, about what grew your passion for languages, but I'd love to hear from you, Alex. What was the thing that gave you the passion for language? Well, um, I think I was very lucky in a way to grow up in a sort of bilingual household. My mum is half Greek. Uh, she was born and raised in London, but um, she speaks Greek and she was very, very keen that I should learn about that side of my heritage and learn to speak the language. Um, unfortunately, I was not that interested and uh, always used to tell my mom, oh, why are you speaking this Greek to me? I don't, you know, it's a strange game you're playing. And I'd always reply in English. And she was getting very, very frustrated until one year when I was about eight years old. She said, OK, that's it. We've had enough. We're getting on a plane and we're going to Greece for three months for the whole summer. And uh, if you don't speak Greek, you're going to have to spend the whole time with me because you're not going to make any friends. And um, so we got there, this beautiful place. I hated it. I wanted to go straight back to London and see my friends. I wasn't interested in the sea, wasn't interested in anything. I just wanted to go home. Um, and for the first few weeks, I spent all the time with my mum. And then I, you know, we got a bit sick of each other. And I was seeing all these other kids around me kind of playing, fishing, swimming. And um, I thought, well, OK let's give it a go. So I went over and I started trying to speak some Greek that I'd remembered that my mum had been speaking to me. And, you know, it kind of all just went from there. Cause I think that was a point where I realized that languages are not something that you just learn at school. Languages are not just something that you need to kind of reel off when you want to order a beer or something like that. But actually languages are this incredibly unique access point to other cultures. And they're a way to talk to people around the world that you maybe have a lot in common with, that maybe you can form amazing relationships that last your whole life with. But if you don't have a way of speaking to them, there's no way you're even gonna get off the ground. So that was when really languages came alive for me. And then from then I started teaching myself languages. I started teaching myself Dutch, Russian, Hebrew, Catalan, Afrikaans, everything you could imagine basically. It was sort of a, a slightly obscure hobby that got a bit out of control. And uh, then ever since then, my whole life has been about languages. I've always lived in different countries. I've always made my work about languages. And as a documentary filmmaker, I know for a fact that I wouldn't be able to interview people in the way that I can and hear their stories in their own words unless they were able to tell me in their own language, in their own words, what had happened to them. So a lot of your learning of the languages has actually happened outside of the classroom environment. Is that right? I mean, I've dabbled in everything. I have a degree in modern languages. Uh, I studied German and Russian. Uh, for my bachelor's. So that was an interesting mix of very formal uh, study, learning massive vocabulary lists every weekend. But then also as part of that degree, I actually had to go to Russia for a year to study and uh, live with a host family. So I actually say that, you know, when I arrived in Russia for the first time, I knew all these crazy words, like uh, the words for a small white picket fence, or all the nine different words for different types of snow boot. But I remember being in the airport and not knowing how to ask for a bottle of water in the shop. Okay. You know, it was this real disconnect. So I always say that actually I learned Russian around the kitchen table with my host family. We used to sit there every night when it was minus 30 outside drinking tea with a big dictionary on the table and talking about our lives. And uh, if we didn't know words, we'd look them up. And just over the course of the year, I mean, by the end of that, I just, you know, was thinking in Russian, dreaming in Russian. I came back to England and Russian was still just in my head so much, you know. So I've done a little bit of everything in terms of how to learn it. But I think the one thing that really is important when you learn a language is that you know why you want to do it and if you have your reason for learning a language very clear whatever it is whether it's because you're interested in the culture you're living in a place you're in love anything like that it doesn't matter as long as you're motivated you'll find solutions to the problems that will otherwise stop you from learning you've said a similar thing Susie haven't you about finding this one thing in a language that can give you a passion to learn as well 
Yeah, and I think it's very instinctive. I think you just find something that, I mean, I think I said in the in my last episode um, when I was talking to you that actually it feels like coming home even now when I speak German or hear German. And I can't explain that. It's such a sort of... Um, Oh, it sounds silly to say primeval. I, I don't know what it is in me because I have no family connection to German whatsoever, maybe in a past life, I don't know. Um, but it was it was funny, a lot of what Alex said actually just chimed with me as well in terms of, you know, learning all this amazing German and French literature and then not really knowing. I remember going into, um, in my year in Germany, when I was doing my bachelor's, um, that I spent my year in Berlin and just outside Dusseldorf. And I remember going in and really wanting one of these round, delicious raisin pastries and not having a clue what they were called. And someone kept saying, Schnecke, Schnecke. And I knew that was a snail. I thought, no, I don't want a snail. I want <laughs> one of these things. Um, and it was just silly things like that. You just, you can't, until, until you're really, really immersed in it, I think you just can't, you, yeah, you'll never get the hang of it. But also I would say when Alex said he was dreaming in Russian, I think when I first dreamt in German, that's when I knew, absolutely knew that I got somewhere, I'd got to the point I really wanted to get to. Do you both find you know, thinking in other languages as well then? Yeah, I, I do. I, just the whole year that we've had obviously has been so awful and the word that keeps coming to me and I can't find the right English translation of it is the French word bouleversé, like everything's overturned and I am overturned and overwhelmed and everything. And that's all encapsulated in that one French word, but I can't, I can't express it any other way. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about dying languages. So for our listeners, are there a lot of dying languages around the world? Alex is yes. the expert here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer to that question is yes. There are a lot of dying languages around the world. Um, okay, so I think maybe we need to understand a little bit about what a dying language is and what that means. Now, obviously a language is, okay, so the way we talk about endangered languages and dying languages is we use the metaphor of dying and we use the metaphor of endangered. And a lot of the time, some people get confused because they hear these words that they're normally used to hearing about something like a panda, but we're not talking about a panda, we're talking about a language. Okay, so just as how, you know, we all know that pandas are threatened in the world, and that if something's not done to preserve them in 10, 15, 20 years time, our children and grandchildren may never see a panda in real life. It's actually the same thing with a language, even though a language isn't an animal. Uh, because uh, there's a number of different pressures that are happening. I mean, the, for example, there's actually the, the UNESCO list of endangered languages will list hundreds of thousands of languages, which basically have a critical number of speakers, which means that it's a very small number of people who speak that language and they all tend to be in a specific age group, which is sort of 60 plus. And unfortunately their descendants are not learning that language and they're not showing the interest in speaking it and don't necessarily see it as their language uh, in quite the same way. So that means that basically, unfortunately, we may face a situation where the language stops to exist or the language dies. Now, many people might say, why do we care? Why do we care if um, some obscure language spoken in the outback of Australia dies? Wouldn't these people be much better off learning languages like English and Chinese and being able to connect with the world? And um, there's a couple of things we can say about that. I mean, first of all, if we go back to the panda um, analogy, why do we care if the panda dies? It's just an animal that we don't have wandering down the streets of London or wherever we live. It's not something we're going to see ourselves. But if you care about diversity, and if like I do, you like living in a world which is very diverse, not just in terms of animals, in terms of trees, but also, you know, thinking about human diversity, thinking about the fact that the world is full of so many different people, then you should care about the fact that these languages are really threatened. Because when those languages die, we don't just lose words. We lose a whole network, a whole collected experience of the way that a certain group of people has lived their life, which is codified in that language through the humor, through the idioms, through the expressions, and also just through the mere ability of a group of people being able to communicate amongst themselves. So to answer your question, yes, there are a lot of languages that are dying. Uh, I just wanted to explain what that actually means and also a little bit about what we lose when a language which is very important does die. Susie, Alex mentioned um, identity there and you were nodding along. Um, mm. How do you think that the loss of a language can affect people's cultural identity? 
Um, well, massively, and I was going to ask um, Alex before, I don't know if I'm right about this, but but linguicide, it's one of the 10 forms of genocide, isn't it, that is listed by the UN. Um, and that's how, you know, devastating it can be. But um, yeah, it is, well, as Alex said, it is all about um, how you identify. I mean, language is inherently tribal, and you could take any form of slang, and it'll be the sort of the group slang that both um, bonds people together and keeps outsiders out. And in this case, it's quite interesting because it's, it's a reverse of that. You want it to um, be eloquent about your identity and you want it to be something that binds you together. But at the, same, at the same time, we need this to kind of get out there and not be closed off because it's so important that actually they are preserved through exposure. And also it was really interesting thinking about these kind of imperial, imperialistic policies that stamped out so many beautiful indigenous languages, whether in America, North America or um, in Australia. And, and I hadn't really considered the fact that new media, which we always praise because, you know, the online world is generating so much opportunity for groups of people to find each other. You know, if you're a Bavarian Morris dancer, you can find another Bavarian Morris dancer online and connect with them and you will have your own lexicon. But at the same time, social media are actually insisting on certain types of language in order to get the exposure you need. So it's not giving an opportunity for these gorgeous, beautiful, um, you know, rich languages to actually be out there. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that we should all think about, I think. What do you think are some of the ways that we can protect these languages, though? Well, I was thinking about uh, one of the one of the surprising endangered languages for me, and I didn't really consider this one, was Irish Gaelic, which has got um, about 40,000 speakers, I think. And, you know, there are several communities in Ireland that is it the Gaeltacht where Irish is still spoken, but actually it is it is on the endangered list and there's so much to be lost just through that such a beautiful language it sounds like the landscape around it and it's a really intimate connection with Irish heritage but there is quite a lot that is actually being done to try and preserve it I guess a little bit like the initiative to um to save and uh, and promulgate Welsh um so there's there's lots of activities going on there but Alex will know more than me in terms of you know codified efforts to actually to to do this because you know it's a race against time I'm guessing I think yeah it is exactly a race against time because I think the problem is I mean well if I give you the example of a project I've been working on recently in Greece um, my parents actually well the place that my mother took me to when I was eight years old and forced me to learn Greek ironically actually is the home of an endangered language which is the only surviving descendant of the language of the ancient Spartans that language is called Sakonica and uh, it's always been this strange thing because I've been going to that place my whole life. My parents uh, have been basically taking refuge there during the whole coronavirus pandemic, which has been absolutely fantastic. Um, but I kind of realized that, you know, this language is here and who's speaking it? I never hear it. Do people know it? And if this is the only direct descendant of the language of the ancient Spartans, why don't we care about this? Because this is a huge part of Greek history and a huge part of European history that, you know, this language is spoken. Um, but again, so I went there this summer to kind of start working on this documentary and I kind of spent a week camped out at the central greengrocers, uh, interviewing people who were coming in and asking them. And basically I was amazed to find that people did speak it, but they were all over 60. And uh, they all said that their children don't speak it. And they all said that their grandchildren don't speak it. And they all said, you know, look, we're, we're in our 60s. We're living through a global pandemic. We don't know how much longer we're going to be here for. And when we go, we're going to take the language with us. The language is just going to be a museum to our, our ancestry and our heritage. But no one is going to speak it anymore. Now, um, why are people not speaking this language? Why, why is it not being passed down? And uh, I think the answer to that is actually very common across a lot of places like this, which is that it's all to do with the perceptions of people about the status of that language, the prestige of it. And unfortunately, in an era of mass media, which as we were saying, connects us, binds us together, means that you can be sitting in Johannesburg watching a TV series from Miami and feel like you're there, it's absolutely wonderful. But the problem is as well, that it all happens in these majority languages. And a big thing that happened to that community in Greece well, two big things happened. First of all, in 1957, the road to Athens opened and half the population moved to Australia and uh, New York and places like that and just abandoned the place. But the second thing that happened was the arrival of mass media and the arrival of TV in Greek. 
which meant that for the very first time, people growing up in that area were not listening to their native ancestral language every day, but they were listening to Greek on the TV and they started speaking that language instead. And now, because Greek has this big culture behind it, lots of support, lots of TV, lots of you know music, everything, Greek is the prestige language. Greek is the language of aspiration. Greek is the language that will get you out of that place and get you a nice life in Athens. But Sakonika doesn't even have a literature. You know, so if I come back to your question, Alex, about like, what do we need to do to protect the languages? For me, we need to speak positively about them. We need to spread understanding of the fact that these languages are a fundamental part of our shared heritage as human beings. And they are a sign of the time that we've spent on this earth. And we need to protect them. They're beautiful. And when people speak those languages, we should praise them. And we should, you know, we do really good things. So for example, some things I always do whenever I see a film a song, a book, anything like that coming out in an endangered or an indigenous language, I buy it because I know that if you can show that these things have economic power, they will be supported by major corporations. So, you know, so it's just, we need to help change everybody's mind about these things and realize that there isn't a linguistic hierarchy that's natural, it's a political thing. And to break it, we need to encourage everyone to be themselves and be proud of their identity and heritage. So if we're thinking about the UK, there's obviously so many different accents, even just between cities. So if you go from Manchester 20 miles down the road to Liverpool, you've suddenly got a completely different accent, completely different dialect words as well. Do you think it's actually important to protect these different slang words? I think it's hugely important. And actually, the line now between local dialect and local slang is so thin. I think that the sort of they're all encompassed in the same thing. But um, there was a wonderful project to try and capture dialects by uh, Joseph Wright. This was um, 200 years ago. And it was so I was so pleased to see last year that the University of Leeds have announced the sort of continuation of that project. So they are going around and making a regional survey of, um, of dialect, which is fantastic. Fantastic. And quite often when this happens, we all expect the bad news to come back that these dialects and accents are, well, dialect is accent and vocab really, that it's, you know, it's dying out and it's being replaced by some bland, monolithic, homogenized language. But actually the BBC did a project a while ago called Voices and what came back was so um, uplifting really because it showed that yes some words are dying out of course but others are kind of quickly being invented by the young who are mashing up you know their words with the words of their parents and their grandparents and it's still being preserved and it's just become really important and also local accents are now really celebrated on the radio you know forget BBC English you know if you've got a really strong accent that's really good um, having said that I think there are some cool accents and and some ones that are still considered uncool so Geordie is probably the coolest one on the phonetic map at the moment but you know people still mock Brummy um, I could listen to a scouse all day um, so I think it's you know uh, there are still huge stereotypes attached to these but I think it's incredibly important to recognize them protect them bring us back to Shakespearean days where dialects were everywhere and everyone had local words and you know e even I guess before printing um you know people spoke in their local tongue and it wasn't really that important that you had one that was going to be nationally understood um and now of course that the, the imperatives are different but yes long live dialect I say you said about the Brummie accent as well. I remember being on a train last year back into London, just got chatting to this guy and he said that he had this interview and it thought it went really well, except they all spoke with received pronunciation and he was the only person in the room with this really strong accent. And I think he still felt that he was being judged not on his skills, but on the way that he spoke. Um, yeah. I'm sure I think we all make assumptions don't we when we hear a particular accent and it's the same with West Country though there's been quite a few um, studies of West Country dialect recently where they've discovered that even ducks speak in kind of Zimmerset um, so that even they have a different kind of quack <laughs> to ducks elsewhere and the animals somehow are absorbing their kind of local landscape and their local language which I think is brilliant um, and I know that sounds really wacky or quacky but there have actually been other dialects to sort of support that with cow cows and things I don't know the ins and outs but it's fascinating I think I've been judged about my accent wherever I've been so I actually grew up in the north and in the north they'd say oh you're too posh you sound like a southerner yeah and then as soon as I moved south everyone says oh you've got such a northern accent so <laughs> I don't really feel like I can fit in anywhere with my accent to be honest <laughs> uh, I think it's good I think well, for me you've got quite a 
just I would say lovely lilt but it's slightly unplaceable but you know that's good it just adds to your enigma and enigmatic enigmaticness if I can okay. even say that <laughs> but it's quite interesting too that even the Queen's accents are supposed to have changed so if you trace her Christmas broadcast over time you will find that she's become um, a little bit less posh and um, is starting to kind of you know make her vowels a little bit less rounded etc so we're all doing it and again it's the sense of identity you want to fit in so you you kind of espouse the sounds um around you so again it's very much a kind of tribal in the loose sense um use of language do you that's very speak? interesting that the queen is toning her accent down i hadn't quite realized well i hadn't picked it up when i listened to her but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, don't it's happening. Off. I don't think she says off quite so much oh. or super or that she probably never says super but i think um no i think she's definitely dropped the real exaggeration um that you would yeah. find you've both talked a little bit about, about how there's a renewed interest which is really brilliant but do you think using the brits as a case study we're still a bit guilty of going abroad and expecting people just to speak English. Definitely, I think we are incredibly lazy. I mean, just listening to Alex there, it seems so ironic that, you know, this is the age of the internet. This is the age of global communication. Yes, but language doesn't have to become globalized with it. I mean, there are just so many tribal dialects that are, are emerging online as I say to kind of demarcate different groups and and you know there are lexicons for every type of social media and conventions and all that and you know this is the perfect perfect platform for us to to try and capture those indigenous languages so I totally understand that a lot of them are just oral and not written down but you know this is the age when we can do it surely um but yes, I think I think the British are, well, first of all, we tend to look down on other languages because we assume that everybody should speak English and that it's the best one in the world. Um, and I just, I don't know whether we, I, I actually genuinely don't know whether that the sort of lack of ability to learn a language is instilled at us and, and we are inherently predisposed to say, no, actually, I'm no good at that. I'm not going to bother. Or whether it is just that, you know, colonial attitude that we shouldn't really have to try. I don't know. I don't know what Alex thinks about that. I think it's probably a mix of everything that you just said. I don't think it has to be a single factor. Mm. Um, I think everything you said is absolutely right. And all of those things are contributing to the situation. But the one thing that I'd add is that as native English speakers, we are born with an incredible amount of privilege in this world, right. an absolutely yeah. unfathomable amount of privilege to the extent that I could basically move anywhere in the world and probably find a full-time job where I could speak my native language that pays pretty well. I mean, just the depths of this privilege that we have as native English speaker are just boundless. And I think the problem is that it makes us very comfortable because for example, I live in Barcelona now, but before the pandemic, I used to go back to London every now and then and visit my mum and she'd always like to make a fuss of me and she'd always like to, you know, get, make me tea and kind of then take the cup and wash it up and all this stuff. And, you know, I'm tempted at some point to say, thanks, mum. Yeah, please do all the washing up. I don't want to lift a finger, you know, <laughs> but actually, no, I should get up and wash the cup. And I say that this is the same thing about when British people go abroad. Everyone's going to make a fuss about us. Everyone's going to want to speak our language. Everyone is going to tell us how much they love our language, how they want to speak like us. But does that mean that we shouldn't make any effort to learn their language? No, I think we all know deep down, even the most ardent English speaking British people that are out there, we all know deep down that when we're in someone else's home, we're guests and we ought to show them respect and we ought to show them gratitude for their hospitality. And what that means in terms of languages is that you learn a bit of the language. Which language would you recommend as, as something that people could study and maybe, uh, look at as a filter to understanding the people who speak it and in so doing keep it alive? Well I think every language offers you that um, that pathway to the culture it doesn't matter which language it is every single language is like holding a pair of keys to this Pandora's box of whichever culture it is so it's hard to kind of give a single answer because I think learning in general is one of the most intimate and most personal experiences mm. that we can have in life and that means that we all learn differently and we all learn for different reasons and we all learn different things so often when people look at my kind of let's call it list of languages and they see all these weird things like Yiddish and Hebrew and Hungarian and all that they're going well, why didn't you just learn Chinese isn't that the most important language but you know every single language I've learned there's a story there and there's a history and there's reasons why I've learned every one and every single one has a strong emotional meaning for me so if you're thinking about which language to learn 
um, I would ask you to look deep inside yourself mm. at the languages that you've most wanted to study, the languages which you've been in situations where you said, gosh, I wish I could just speak to this person. You know, look at the languages that are around you. Um, I was so, so, so lucky to grow up in multicultural London uh, in the 90s and 2000s when immigration was a lot freer than it is now. Mm. Uh, and when I could leave my house every day and hear between 25 and 50 languages just on my way to and from school. And those languages were the languages that I wanted to learn because I was having contact with them. I wanted to chat in Turkish with um, the guy who would sell me my newspaper. I wanted to overhear the South Africans who were gossiping about their housemate on the bus. I, want, I just wanted to, you know, it was such a weird experience to be in your own country, in your own city, and surrounded by so many languages that you can't understand. And then about London, definitely. it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> because the best thing is when you start learning those languages and then suddenly you start tuning in everywhere and you start mm. hearing what people are talking about. And then you realize actually, however diverse the world is, we're not actually that different. And we all gossip about a housemate and we all, you know, have different advice about how to cook spaghetti properly. And it's just, these are all the kind of very inane conversations going on around you in these beautiful languages. But because you work for it, you can understand them. So for the people listening at home, you guys as expert linguists, what do you find works for you when learning a new language? So I think there's basically three things you've got to have in place to learn a language, which is time, resources and motivation. Uh, we've talked a little bit about motivation already, you know, it can be any reason in the world, but as long as you feel excited every day to get up and learn that language, you've got it. Time is super, super, super important because if you don't actually make the time in your schedule to learn the language, it's not going to learn itself, you know, and you don't necessarily need a lot of time in order to learn that language. I mean, I'd say probably even just 20 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day, if that's all you can manage, is still going to keep everything fresh in your brain, it's still going to keep things going in and it's going to build up in the long term. Um, but the final thing that's really important is resources. Once you know you want to learn a language, you know when you're going to learn a language, what are you going to use to learn that language? And uh, personally, I think one of the best things about learning languages nowadays is that we have access to so many really convenient uh, apps and technology and resources like, for example, something like Rosetta Stone, which you can keep in your pocket on your phone and just whip out at any time and just quickly do five, 10 minutes. I mean, that really is the best way to keep your brain fresh, to not lose um, any concentration, to not lose your enthusiasm and also to make sure that over time, you're building up that repertoire of knowledge, which one day is going to mean that you'll be able to speak that language. Um, I think you're right. And the only other piece of advice I'd give to someone is, especially as we're talking about dying languages, don't always assume that the language you learn has got to be practical and you've got to be able to apply it in life. Learn it for its beauty. Learn it for what it, uh, you know, what window it gives you into other people's lives. And um, yes, just learn it because you want to learn it. Don't worry about how you're going to use it. I thoroughly recommend that everybody goes and learns Hungarian and Zulu. You will never have more fun in your entire wow. life than getting your tongue around those clicks. Is that got anything to do with Tosk and Gag? That's all I know about Hungarian, the two dialects. Oh, I think you know more about Hungarian than me. Because no, I used to work for AUP and we had Hungarian dictionaries. And I remember always being asked, is it Tosk or Gag? And I can't remember the answer. <laughs> So unfortunately, I think that's all we've got time for today, guys. So just a very big thank you to both of you, to Susie and to Alex. It's been absolutely fascinating. I could have listened to you talk all day. Thank you. Thank you both, Alexes. Thank you guys so much. And Viszontlátásra, which is Hungarian for goodbye. In honour of our expert guest, Susie Dent, who's known for her word of the day on Twitter, we are giving you the opportunity to win a year's subscription to the Rosetta Stone app. All you have to do is tweet Susie with your favourite foreign word of the day from a language discussed in this episode, along with the hashtag MoreThanWords, and Susie will retweet her favourite. Bonne chance!